Hello and welcome to Castable. This is the podcast which brings on brilliant guests to pitch their dream music festival. My name's Matt Hoss and I'm a host, and my job is to help you, listener, to sneak in all the copious amounts of alcohol to your campsite, and I'm here to let you know all about the best kept secrets of the festival. Today's guest is a comedic tour de force. He's a stand-up comedian, actor, playwright, and so much more. <laughs> he was nominated for Best Newcomer at End of Fringe 2015 and is famously known for being a member of Pappies. Please welcome the legendary Tom Parry. How's it oh, going? Oh, what a delightful introduction. Oh, I had fun writing that one, no fan. I'll, so I was I'll like, tell you. Yeah, uh, so how are you doing today? Oh, yeah, great. Well, I'll tell you how I'm doing. I am missing music festivals. Yes, oh my God, yeah. Yeah. Obviously, like, sitting down and starting to compile... A festival lineup and i mean like listener if i mean like it's a heat wave at the moment mm-hmm. and and so it's like that heady british heat mm-hmm. that just mm-hmm. makes you want to be in a field yeah. with a warm can in your bag and, and listening to music and so so actually i for the you know i've been i've tried to keep quite upbeat throughout this weird old year mm-hmm. but today has been a strange one because it's really made me realize you know it's the first time in Gosh, it's the first year in about 15 years that I haven't been to a music festival. Yeah, right. It's so yeah. weird. Yeah. And it's kind of like, it's it's a big loss. Big loss to my summer. And what I've realised, like, there's a certain, as you mentioned, that heady British, uh, like, weather as well. It's, uh, what I've noticed is that on, like, a Saturday night or over the weekend where the, the sun is just setting as well and you listen to music, it's about, like, seven eight o'clock and just right before that time before the headliner comes on when the sun just sets as well it's that like perfect time and i looked at the sun uh, earlier this week and said, oh that, that would have been a perfect festival moment yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely <laughs> and i think that it's one of the, my favorite uh festival moments i think you've just identified it that kind of pre-headline anticipation mm, you know yeah when you just think here we go yeah. uh it's so it's <laughs> so good so good yeah especially because like like the uh, the waits in between because in between the um, earlier in the day it's quite a short turnaround but later on for the headline there's a lot of admin going on they make you wait a little bit longer it's like a longer wait it's like oh they really won't know what set they're gonna do and yeah oh god yeah um you kind of work out who your set's gonna be for the mm-hmm. gig so you kind of go like oh i borrowed that guy's lighter and we yeah. had a chat and we've been having a joke and yeah. she's all right and mm-hmm. then so like kind of as the night kind of grows you mm-hmm. kind of get a sense of who these people are and yeah then, oh, it's because like um, uh, i as the listeners know i'm a massive fan of like uh, uh i've been to download festival the most because I, I was a massive rock fan as when i was younger as well really went to a lot of those festivals when i was a teenager and i uh but i went there in 2018 uh, obviously uh, a lot older but like i i i went and it was so magical because you start off with having no friends and i go by myself as well because i'm amazing yeah but you end up with that community around you in fact i saw guns and roses live and uh, i talked about this in my ember show and i saw during uh knocking on heaven's door this guy was about to have like an argument with his girlfriend a bit of like a a, like a tension there but it turns out he was about to propose and he he proposed during uh the song and everyone around him just got like was doughy eyed and stuff like that and it was such a wonderful moment it really everyone around us was felt so joyous from that as well amazing yeah well dude wait until i get to my saturday night headliners because uh, i've got a story for you there oh yes please yes please (laughs) oh i'm loving this already yeah the kind of first question I like to start with with this podcast is if someone were to ask you what kind of music are you into, how do you typically respond to that question? Uh, well, I mean, like what I'd like to be able to respond is like I like all kinds of music and I mm-hmm. try and have as broad a church as possible. But I think, you know, I can't really get away from the fact that I'm an indie kid at heart. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I try, you know, and I do and I do. I listen to, you know, I love like if I, you know, when I look at my vinyl, it's kind of like actually quite mostly soul and Motown on my vinyl because mm-hmm. I don't buy a lot of indie records on vinyl, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, but um, when push comes to shove, when you look at the stats on my playlist and stuff, yeah. I am an indie kid at heart, you know, because I was obviously born in 1980. So I was, you know, just that sweet spot of like 94, 95 through to, you know, the early noughties. Mm-hmm. It, it, that's kind of my time. So, you yeah. know, it's very hard for me to look past that. That kind of defined me as a, as a music fan. It's, I find it so weird how much music 
it, the identity shapes you when you're younger as well. Like uh, I think I'm the same as you. I uh, I like to have a, a wide taste and stuff like that. But also, I can't get rid of the the feelings I had as a teenager and that con- emotional connection to that music at that time as well. So you always yeah. have that your your footprints there, right? Absolutely. And I and I don't know whether I mean like, I you know for those listeners that don't know me, I'm, I mean I most of my comedy career I've been in a sketch group. I'm in a sketch group, <laughs> and I don't know for me as well. It's something about watching bands. Like I love I love <laughs> watching the group dynamic of a band yes. that are together yeah, on yeah, stage, yeah. and like and and I love the raucous energy that they can push out into a crowd and have between themselves. And <laughs> um, so you know, like that is kind of my uh, that's my passion always seems to lie with kind of like bands and and and, and so uh, yeah I, at heart i'm an indie kid uh really that's brilliant rock and, and roll and indie nothing yeah like. <laughs> oh, we're gonna have a this is gonna be a good festival i know it i know it so did you ever want to be a musician uh, obviously you are a comedian but like it was there any intention to ever perform as a musician I mean, I, I've always been a really, really enthusiastic singer. Never, with never any kind of talent to to sing, and uh, and, I, and I think if I could, you know, I, you know, try and live with as as few regrets as possible. But I think yeah. there's what the one regret I would have is. You know, I used to, I didn't really pay attention during music classes. Yeah. And I learned yeah. the recorder. Yeah, yeah, I kind yeah. of felt like music, oh, it's a boring lesson. Oh, come on, let's get on with the fun stuff. Mm-hmm. And I would so go back in time and say to myself, pay attention in music, mm-hmm. learn an instrument mm-hmm. because you are going to want to be in a band. And I think, um, you know, our sketch group, I think was always, you know, there, there's an adage that they always say, like every comedian wants to be a, a musician, a rock star, and every rock star wants to be a comedian. Mm-hmm. And I, I think every sketch group is at heart some kind of frustrated band. <laughs> and, oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. You know, and I, I, I kind of feel like, you know, certainly we talked a lot about it as pappies, the, you know, uh, the, the more we performed, the more we wanted to get our... I was, in fact, I was I was with Crosby, who's also in Pappies. Uh, you know, I was at Primavera with Crosby, and we were watching La Savie Fav, mm-hmm. just doing this chaotic, you know, anarchistic set where they mm-hmm. were jumping into the audience and the energy of it. And I just said to him, like, that is what we should be doing. Yeah. That yeah. can we do that? You yeah. know, what's the sketch comedy equivalent of that? And sadly, there isn't one because it's just like, you know, <laughs> it's we there. tried, we yeah. failed, but we tried that. Yeah, exactly. That's it. <laughs> no, but like I, I adore that as well. And I think that goes for any art type as well. Because I remember seeing comedians when I would start now and be like, oh my God, that blows my mind. And uh, without being too sycophantic, that's why I love Yellow T-shirt. Because as a as a oh. someone starting out in <laughs> in a comedy, like just seeing the raw magnitudinal things, that that's the same reaction I had as well. Is that I wanted applying that to my own thing as well. And I, I yeah, I think that works. Uh, same with music as well. I think a good gig, you can always tell a good gig if you want to play a song afterwards. Like oh, I wish I could play that song afterwards. Yeah. Or I want to learn guitar. That's a good gig. Absolutely. And I think, re- like, honestly, I think, like, in terms of my inspirations as a performer, mm-hmm. uh, I think they're always musicians and coming from live music performances rather than it, it, watching other comedians and going, oh, I want to be like that comedian. Mm-hmm. Instead, I kind of go, oh, I want to be like, you know, like when, I, when you see Fat White Family, you know, like <laughs> causing chaos on stage mm-hmm. at a festival. I'm like, that's what I want to be. And, and so it's always been kind of like musicians have kind of been more of an inspiration to me than comedians, really. Oh, wow. I love that a lot. How many festivals do you reckon you've been to in your lifetime? Yeah. Uh, plenty i mean like obviously the the biggest perk of the job of being uh in comedy is like if you're lucky enough to kind of start getting into the the kind of festival circuit mm-hmm. so we've done every we did every latitude bar the first latitude so wow, i think we've cool. done every latitude um yeah bar the very first year um so that's a whole load and then and then kind of like with green man mm-hmm. Whenever I'm not in Edinburgh, I do Green Man. End of the road, we try and do most years, and I try and mm-hmm. go to. Um, so I was already doing Latitude and Green Man and End of the Road as performers. And then in 2013, for some reason, I hadn't um, gone to Glastonbury. I oh, always wow. just thought, oh, well, you know, I'm not sure if Glastonbury's for me or not. And like uh, me and Ben, when, uh, my other partner from um, Pappy's, when we were 18, we went to Leeds, Reading. Mm-hmm. So that would have been like, I think, 97, 98. Oh, my God. Um, 
which is one of those lineups, by the way, that when you look at it, you kind of just can't get your head around it. Right, because I was actually, from my, just uh, by accident, I was looking at the old Leeds Reading lineups, and there's some where you're just like, holy heck, imagine, like it, some of them are dream festivals. Like, I, I'm sorry to cut off you mid No, 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 story, absolutely, but like, absolutely. Um, my first, my brother's first festival he ever went to was Leeds uh, 2008. And I was, I was um, 15 at the time. And I just think I was just a bit too young to go for it. But there was Metallica, Rage Against the Machine, The Killers. It was like Slipknot and, and that's quite a heavy lineup, but Avenged Sevenfold. But there's like eight headliners in a single day. Yeah, you know I mean? It's like how, how on earth is like, like this is crazy. Yeah. So, but yeah, uh, 1997 Leeds. It was like, I think there was Oasis, there was Pulp, there was Rage Against yeah. the Machine. Um, there was like Beck, there was, it, it was, it was insane. Um, yeah. and, 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 uh, but then for some reason didn't go to Glastonbury and then we started performing and we were always kind of busy previewing for Edinburgh and things to go into Glastonbury. And then finally in 2013, Ben and I were like, do you know what? Let's go to Glastonbury this year. And genuinely it was, you know, the single best decision that, uh, I ever made in my life and, and mm-hmm. I've been every year since every year there's been a Glastonbury since and you know I've kind of made a promise to myself that I, I'll always be at Glastonbury because it's it's just the 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 place to be for me uh it's kind of you know it's kind of quite uh overwhelming the way I feel about that mm-hmm. that kind of week so what about Glastonbury puts it above a above- places for you as well i mean it's the true i mean like, it's wild of music festivals full stop but glastonbury mm. in particular it's like the truest sense of you know a holiday away from the, you know life you kind of it's pure escapism and once you walk through those gates you are in a you are literally in a different world and um yeah and it's a better world you know yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah and like you know i feel that way about for most music festivals is for like three or four days people are it's kind of utopia <laughs> kind of like you know i love that as well because you're surrounded by mostly like-minded people as well and uh yeah especially yeah glastonbury is there's a lot of heart there and like you get to see people do, as, as I mentioned earlier, I love seeing people with passions and, uh, and you get to just go around and around, just stumble across things as well. And I love the kind of impromptu nature of it as well. Yeah, absolutely. And just the scale of it is incredible. Mm-hmm. You know, like it is a, it's a city really. Mm-hmm. It isn't like a festival. It's a city with suburbs and you can have yeah. so many different festivals there. You know, it's the scale of Glastonbury is just breathtaking really. All right. Well, let's go and set up camp in your festival and learn about the fundamentals. Thank you so much for listening to Castival Season 2. We hope you really enjoyed this awesome season. If you haven't done so already, please, please give us a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts. Those ratings really mean a lot, and thank you to all who have uh, given them so far. Please help support the podcast in the way, and why don't you follow us at Castful Podcast and send us an email at castfulpodcast at gmail.com. See you soon. Enjoy the final episode. Needing a a late last night and I've got no place to go I took a wrong turn and now I'm here I'm pissing in the field in the So Tom, what is the name of your festival? I guess I was, I'll call it Paradise, I think. Oh, hello. <laughs> strong, strong. I mean, I'm a big fan of a pun. Yes. My, my wife and I got married last year and mm. uh, we first we first met in Glastonbury. Oh, and, really? Um, and like we had like a, a festival kind of feel to it. And the, the after club of our wedding was called uh, Wix Paradise because. Oh, um, Wix. So I think lovely. I think I'd go with Paradise. Yeah, yes, I festival. love that. That'll and also. It. As you just mentioned, with the idyllic nature of Glastonbury as well, it kind of adds to that that sense of euphoria you were discussing as well. Absolutely. So, where that's geographically is your festival? Gosh, that that is something I haven't even thought about. You know, um, I imagine. I mean, I think it's going to be in the UK. I mean, yeah. no, it's definitely going to be in the UK because what I love about British festivals is the unpredictability of it. And I know mm-hmm. that means you get some really shitty, muddy <laughs> years, but they are as good as the incredible. Yeah, yeah. They're as characters finding, you know, those muddy days and, the you know, a, a rainy afternoon, but then the sun comes out and then you dry off and all of that. It's kind of like, so I would not change that for a thing. Yeah. I would probably say it'll be in the Southwest, I imagine. I mean, obviously you don't want to give Glastonbury a run for their money. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'm, you know, I recently set up shop in Exeter and it's a beautiful part of the world is Devon. So maybe it'd be somewhere in the southwest i think 
Brilliant. I like that very much. So, without revealing the lineup, how much would you charge per ticket? Well, now you're talking. I mean, yeah. since I was a kid, <laughs> I was thinking about this the other day. I don't know about you, but the first thing that I ever wanted in my life that was prohibitively expensive was a Mega Drive, and that was £120. Yeah. And £120 has never stopped feeling to me like a lot of money, even though it no longer is, you know, like sometimes if I do a big shop Mm -hmm. at Waitrose or, you know, Sainsbury's, it it could Mm -hmm. be 120 quid, Mm -hmm. but it still feels like, God, that's a mega drive's worth of money. Yeah. (laughs) And, and, and it feels like a nice chunk of change. It's got Mm -hmm. a nice round figure to it. I'm going to say 120 quid. I like that. It's that point where it's, it's not just throwing around money, but it's a, it's a kind of, it's attainable it's accessible but not it's not undersold if you know what i mean i like yeah. it now it's not practical with my lineup because i'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna need some mysterious benefactors yeah. <laughs> yeah. to bring in some of my headliners I tell you what because there's some people who have done this uh, podcast before and they're like yeah i'm gonna like it's gonna be like a totally socialist festival which I, by the way i adore but like they're kind of like yeah it's really cool like everything for free you know like it's all good but you know we've got like david bowie doing 18 sets okay so, yeah, it's, yeah. yeah uh, it's gonna be a cash flow issue um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so what's the camping situation like? Are you a big camper? Huge camper. Absolutely yeah. adore camping. And I'm a big fan as well of like a couple of days of camping before the music starts. You know, yeah. Glastonbury, I'm there Tuesday night for, for the queues to be Wednesday morning. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so I, I, I would definitely be up for opening the festival for a couple of days first, just for people mm-hmm. to set up shop get used to it, like decompress, you know, <laughs> so that you can just get used to that way of life before the music starts. Um, yeah, I've camped in some terrible tents. Um, that, <laughs> that, that, that leaves Reading tent. There was yeah. five of us. Ben had a 10 birth tent that he was like, it's a modern 10 birth tent. And I said, do not worry, I'll take yeah. care of the tent. Yeah. And it was this 20 uh, year old, like scout tent there was five yeah, of yeah. us in a three-man tent yeah it oh, mate. oh yeah, no yeah, yeah. no but no again it's all part of the fun yeah. but that but i, I love that because like i think you might be like the spirit of festivals as well because you're, <laughs> you're like you're so joyous and also even when the like the things which might be seen as a bit negative like the rain it's actually a positive because it adds an experience as well and i love that i think that because yeah. re- some people are like oh well you know i just uh, i'm gonna have a festival but i'm gonna have a hotel it's like, that's not the spirit guys come no on way. get get your well he's on you know what i mean it, yeah exactly i shower before i leave the house yeah and i know i'm not going to shower for a week you know maybe the odd wet wipe yeah but that's yeah. it otherwise you know you just think you're here now that's it you're part of the earth because yeah, like I, I know when um, like especially around about like 2010 onwards like clamping came more of the thing and more different different types of people came to the festivals as well and they were like uh well you know there's no showers how are you meant to it's like you're not meant to shower you're meant to be grim you know what i mean like yeah. if yeah if your wet wipe's not black by in, in one like yeah it's, it's you're not worth it you're not doing it right you know what i mean absolutely um but yeah i, I um but yeah I, I think also camping adds to that experience as well because if you um yeah, uh, uh, you have to have the ba- you have to have a bad camp as well because I remember uh, my first year at Leeds in two thousand and nine. I, yeah, my brother and I were in a two man tent, and we I think I've said this before on the podcast, but we're on like a forty five degree hill. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. We were yeah. like woken up every morning down the bank as well. Uh, yeah, but that's it. You got to have that. You got to have not not been able to make it back to your tent. I've woken up under a tree before now. Yeah, you know your tent collapsing. It's like there is. It's all part of it. I think it's definitely all part of it. You have to. So, what is the nightlife like at your festival? Oh, great. There's going to be lots of like DJ sets. Basically, in my lineup, I factored in because I kind of I, I didn't want it to get too, I didn't want it to get too big. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So, I've booked like I think six bands for every day. Brill. Is that right? Yeah. Six bands a day. But then I've also booked a late night secret gig <gasps> because like you cannot beat that's like the joy of a festival is yeah. the chat of like late night secret gigs to be announced lineups so i've put in a few to be announced but like every day as part of the lineup i know there's three bands that are going to do a secret gig in the glade or in the woods yeah. somewhere yeah. and it's like that's where people will go because they know that's going to happen Real. so there'll be a dance there'll be a dance floor with guest djs now i nearly i, I didn't get around to link like announcing who my guest djs were but there'll be yeah, DJ sets all through the evening and then yeah. a late night, uh, like half one, two in the morning, secret gig. Oh, I love that. Yes, 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 yes. Because uh, again, the best thing about Glastonbury as well, not to go back there, but like it's um, 
it's one of those things where the music doesn't stop after the headliner as well. Like there's like loads of sets going on afterwards as well. Like, oh, absolutely. Yeah. You have to, yeah, yeah you yeah, have yeah. to, because you're just so buzzing and you're just like euphoric and it's just like, right, where, and it, that's always my favorite thing to hear at a festival. It's like, where, where are we going now? Where are we going mm. now? And it's just like that kind of, mm. that excitement, the, the chase of the night is amazing. Brilliant. Okay. <laughs> Well, I think uh, that's enough of uh, of the setting up the camp. I think we've got a really lovely picture here. And I think let's head to the, the main gates of your festival. Castable, are you ready? Here we go! Get on your feet! If you know this one, sing along. So I think we're arriving on the Tuesday or Wednesday morning and there's going <laughs> to yeah. be a couple, a couple of, uh, I guess, like maybe a couple of DJ sets or something just chilled in the first couple of days, right? Absolutely. Absolutely right. That's it. Okay. So um, is the first musical act on the Friday then? Yeah. Friday morning is the first musical act. Although I am a big fan of, uh, you know, the whole Glastonbury kind of Thursday night, Williams Green. They have kind of like a, a mm-hmm. you know, a band, you know, just to wet the whistle. Mm-hmm. I, I think the way I've booked it is for, you know, from Friday morning. Because yeah. there's, that, there's that great feeling of the first band of the festival, you know, let's yeah. get things going. So as you've correctly identified, the, the first band is always really important. So who is the first act of Paradise? The first act of paradise is the spook school. Yes. Oh, lovely. So yeah. to, just to peek behind the magician's curse in a little bit, um, these were one of the bands that you shared with me and I had no idea uh, about them before uh, today. And oh, what a joy as well. They are kind of like a, 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 a Edinburgh based indie pop band as well with some Buzzcocks influence. Oh, love it. Right. They're a band that I'm extremely fond of because um, I know them quite well. Oh, so, really? Um, I, yeah, the drummer, Niall, mm-hmm. ran comedy gigs in Edinburgh and I gigged with him and he said, oh, I'm in a band. And so mm-hmm. I said, oh, well, next time you're in London, I'll come and see you. Uh, God, not thinking, you know, you know, you, whenever someone says, oh, I'm in a band, you, it's always a bit of a risk. When you go yeah, yeah, just like, yeah. I went to see them and thought, oh, my God, this is my new favorite band. <laughs> I was yeah, just blown yeah, away. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and so over the years, um, they actually did the soundtrack to the second series of Bad Ults, a sitcom that we did on BBC Three. We asked yeah. them to do the soundtrack for it. Um, so they did that. And then, and then, like, we just watched them grow and grow and grow, really, until, you know, I went to watch them headline at Indie Tracks, an amazing small festival. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, amazing indie, independent festival. They headlined there. And that was one of the best gigs I've ever been at so they are they're the youngest and um new they're like kind of like you know probably one of the smallest bands on the lineup mm. but i just wanted they would absolutely set the tone for the rest of the weekend it's just like yeah. they are so positive they are so inclusive they mm. their hearts are practically bursting out of their chest uh, and i cannot recommend their music enough mm-hmm. um so yeah i think that would really set the tone for this kind of lovely weekend yeah, absolutely. So let's head through the lineup. So from <laughs> let's work our way up the, throughout the day. So school first, who's following yes. them? So, I mean, like, I'm a big fan of feel, this kind of feel-good, uh, you know, afternoons, basically. Mm-hmm. It's kind of what I think festivals are all about. Um, so, so Spook School are going into the Hold Steady. Brilliant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I love Hold Steady. Yeah. So the Hold Steady were kind of like Pappy's unofficial favourite band. So like we kind yeah. of fell in love with Pappy, with uh, the Hold Steady. Um, yeah. We used them for pre-show for a load of our shows mm-hmm. um, because, you know, at the end of all of their gigs, Craig Finn, the lead singer, comes out during their final song and he says, I just want to tell you that for us, there is so much joy in getting to do this for you. Mm-hmm. And it keeps on repeating that phrase, so much joy. And and I remember the first time I ever saw them live was at Latitude on a, on a Saturday afternoon, actually. And we were right mm-hmm. down the front, the Pappy's lot. And we saw them and they came out and they huddled behind the drum kit on stage, but in the background. Mm-hmm. And they all high-fived each other and they gave each other a pep talk and then they came and did the gig. And I just loved that. And we kind yeah. of copied that. We mm-hmm. kind of kept, we had that ethos as pappies. And I just, they're such a joyful band. 
And if you haven't listened to them, people listening, please yeah. check them oh out. My. You know, start with Boys and Girls of America and yeah. then move into Stay Positive. They used to be in another band called Lift a Puller. And Craig Finn said, when I was young, I was trying to write songs that broke the mold. I was trying to write songs that had like odd chord progressions in them. And then he said, the older I got, I realized, isn't it just joyful to play the chord that everybody is waiting for you to play next? Yeah. And like, it's that, it's like his songs are exactly like that. You know, like yeah. the chord progressions are, are, are exactly where you want them to go there's they're full of sing-along songs arms yeah. around you mate sing along yeah again they were another band that you sent over to me and i gen i fell in love with them like uh, immediately because they have that open-hearted rock and roll vibe you know what i mean yeah. it's like it's like immediately there's warmth and endearment like they are friends straight away and yeah it, like there's a lot of um yeah, it's just, it's upbeat, it's positive. Uh, and it, it has like a, a Bruce Springsteen vibe as well. It has Absolutely. Kind of like, yeah, I really love, yeah. yeah so I think that's a, a really great, also, um, I only I found out today as well that uh, Hold Steady did a song for Game of Thrones as well, which is yes. uh, <laughs> incredible. It, they're responsible for one of the most jarring scenes in Game of Thrones. Uh, and uh, for the listener, if you don't know what, what it is, uh, they they did a song called Bear and the Maiden Fair or a rock version of it because in the in the in the books there's a a, a, a bard's version of Bear and the Maiden Fair. What happened? They, they, they recorded it and then they put it at the end of one of the episodes. Uh, at, well, Jamie Lannister gets his hand cut off and then he's like, "Oh God, no!" And then it just goes into this upbeat rock song, which is what like, is very very jarring. Uh, yeah. But who's after the hold steady as well? Because uh, hold steady, and then uh, and then oh, then we've got Jurassic Five. Oh, brilliant! Yeah. So tell them, tell me a little bit more about them. Old school hip hop. Yes. Th- that just really reminds me of being kind of eighteen, nineteen, really kind of starting to discover hip hop. Really, mm-hmm. and what I love about Jurassic Five is they are they're so cool, but they are so much fun. And again, it's that sense of camaraderie, and they have kind of cut chemist as the DJ, mm-hmm. and uh, you know tuna fish, and, and like uh, they they've just got like such a brilliant collective vibe about them mm-hmm. so i just think they're on a lovely sunny afternoon on a friday yes please so you've kind of mentioned it already and you've alluded to it in the hold steady and uh, also in uh, other bands that you've talked about but like how uh, so is dynamic important for you in a band if you see a band which doesn't really have that kind of dynamic is it unappealing to you yeah i mean my, in fact there's only one band on here that uh, uh when, when i come to them that the, the uh, you know, I slightly struggled with when I saw them live, but like, there's a reason. For example, Arctic Monkeys are one of my favourite mm-hmm. bands, but they haven't made the festival lineup because when I see them live, mm-hmm. they they're quite clinical. You know, yeah. no, I think you know, I think they're geniuses, and you know, for the kind of the drumming alone. And yes, Matt Helders. It's just like such an incredible song. You know, back catalogue of songs, songs to burn, and mm-hmm. yet. There just isn't quite that connection. There isn't quite that liveness mm-hmm. that is, you know. So technically, it's amazing, but it just and, and so and, and so that's the reason why you know certain bands haven't quite made it there because of that. Mm-hmm. So yeah, dynamic is everything, and that that liveness and that interaction with the audience and that feeling of like this here, this right now, mm-hmm. is it? It's this. This is what matters. It's this moment between mm-hmm. you and me, and like the great kind of live acts do that you know yeah absolutely i agree and i think there's a joy to see a band who you like who are just playing the songs yeah it's it's fine but i i I know also if you're going to see a band for the first time that you don't know before go and check them out and you see the way that they manipulate the audience to get them on side it's like wow it's an experience you know it's it's a it's it can be life-changing as well i remember um I'm not the biggest fan of them, but I downloaded in 2018. They played uh, Shine Down. Played. Didn't know them before, but they 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 really sold the gig, and uh, and I loved it. You know what I mean? It was an unforgettable moment, and I love yeah. those moments. That's it. Exactly. That's it. That's what it's all about. So then I've got so so I think it's been a very positive festival so far. Like Spook School, Hold Steady, Jurassic Five, and then I've got you know slightly less, um, slightly more angular, interesting act really. Mm-hmm. Um, but I've gone for Saint Vincent. Okay. Who, I don't know if you're aware of her work. But I'm not, unfortunately. She is. So Annie Clark, her name is. Um, mm-hmm. She performs under St. Vincent. And she is just out of this world. You mm. know, prodigiously talented guitarist. Mm. One of the best, one of the best live guitarists I think I've seen ever. Like very skilled, um, amazing guitar solos, but just like incredible, 
an incredible singer songwriter mm-hmm. who is capable of absolutely shredding. She, in fact, she did an album with David Byrne, who's probably my my Mm -hmm. you know musical hero really and she's very much cut from the same cloth she's kind of her 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 live performances have the feel of you know an art show kind Mm -hmm. of an installation she's odd she's interesting she's fucking cool so um so yeah Mm -hmm. so i i I like that because i think she would be well she's by far away one of the more interesting acts on the friday so what kind of music is it uh, is it kind of like avant-garde or is it like bluesy or like um, uh, god how, how to describe it i'm just trying to think it's kind of like um it's kind of like in it's kind of avant-garde indie really i guess yeah how cool. i describe it yeah i like that I, I, and kind of there's the you know uh, in her more recent albums, there's kind of like some beats in there as well. Mm-hmm. It's kind of quite hard to pinpoint, I would say. Mm-hmm. Um, but she is unique, and 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 I I I can't get over. I can't. I like um, I've seen her live three times now, oh, and every time yeah. I just think, bloody hell. She was originally in the Polyphonic Spree, mm-hmm. and then she performed as part of Sufjan Stevens' band, and then oh, she cool. kind of started a solo career. So she's kind of like, that's kind of where she came through. Mm-hmm. In my mind, she's one of the most interesting musical acts active at the moment. So exciting. Yeah. You've got quite, yeah, this is, um, it's a, it's a mixed lineup already, but it's, but somehow the, the theme is quite tight though. Do you know what I mean? Like it's quite, uh, it's, it's collected. It's not exactly a scattergun. It's really, uh, yeah, that's all I was feeling. And, and like, you know, I was tried to spend quite a bit of time as well building the days because mm-hmm. there's nothing, there's nothing worse than an incongruous kind mm-hmm. of like a big gear change in your lineup, especially when you're yeah, yeah. in one stage, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, I, yeah. I'm trying to kind of work the feeling through the, and like St. Vincent, just as it's starting to get a little bit dark, you know, mm-hmm. and it's getting a little bit nappy, I think the lights would really come into effect for her. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I think you've got two more bands left on your Friday. Yeah. So pre-headline act. And in my head, what in my head, quite a perfect pre-headline band because they they they've just got so many great songs, such good stage presence, and such a relentlessly upbeat festival vibe. It's Vampire Weekend. Oh, yes. Uh, absolutely, ab- yeah. yeah. Absolutely yeah, well. love Vampire Weekend. I've seen them a couple of times at Glastonbury, a couple of times on tour. Mm-hmm. And I just think, you know, they're a band that I think, even if for the people who aren't fans, they're, uh, every other song is going to be one that you know. And it's like, don't worry, there's another song coming that you're going to be able to dance to. Mm-hmm. And, it, and I think that's what you need from that kind of pre-headliner act where it's like, let's get everyone going. Yeah, because, uh, absolutely. Yeah. And uh, I think Vampire Weekend, uh, again, I'm not, I don't know the back catalogue well, but I know, as you say, quite enough to have a great time at that festival. I'm going to go there. They're going to be upbeat. You're going to have a nice time. Yeah, I mean, absolutely yeah. right. And I'll tell you what, their albums just uh, have just grown and grown. And mm-hmm. I just absolutely adore them. Really mm-hmm. great band. And they're kind of pinnacle of like, indies in the 2000s like where it's like a massive burst of indie happened like 2005 2006 and vampire weekend were maybe the second wave of that as well but yeah there was that time frame they were of that caliber as well yeah they're a soundtrack to a lot of fun nights for me <laughs> very good <laughs> i would love to hear more off podcasts as well but uh, <laughs> and vampire weekend must be there must be a good band to dance to in a in a field as well absolutely i can absolutely uh tell you that's a fact yes having danced to a field so friday night headliner take friday it night headliner friday night headliners blur oh hello hey yes friday Ooh, night hey. headliners are blur because yeah. i absolutely adore that band and you just look at the breadth of their career you look at the music that they've got to draw on mm-hmm. and their headline sets are you know it, pretty packed they mm-hmm. are absolutely packed and they can do it all you know the big crowd sing-alongs the kind of you know the emotional kind of intensity it, and and also like you know just absolute feel good lose mm-hmm. your shit kind of headline yeah. acts so yeah it's it's gotta be blur for me you know what i i think the theme is so well designed in this because i could kind of see a blur happening there like i didn't want to call it beforehand but i, thought, oh, I can see where this is going oh, yeah. that's good to know that is yeah. good to know yeah they're, they're kind of a perfect band to top that as well and i'll be honest blur are one of these bands which i um 
I think I was just a little bit too late to them, uh, but I, I enjoy their work, but I haven't really uh, got into it. Where would I, where would you tell me to start with Blur? I mean, it, 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 it's very interesting for me because I started when Blur, you know, Park Life is kind of where I think yeah. everyone kind of did it. But I actually think it's the right place to start because I think <laughs> you start with Park Life and then you can go back and see how they got to Park Life. But, you know, for me, my love of Blur is is actually blur blur and i think especially mm-hmm. someone who likes to go to download a lot like i think blur blur is the place to start for you mm-hmm. because that's where they kind of started shifting away from what was kind of like the brit poppy mm-hmm. kind of nature of what defined them with part life in the great escape and blur blur is where they kind of adopted a slightly more american grunge sound and from then they just kind of you know their progression through their career Mm-hmm. Oh God, I, I think it's breathtaking, and I know, I know Damon Albarn isn't the most likable character, but <laughs> it, when you look at the uh, amount that he has produced and the quality and the range of what he's produced, he is he is a real genius, real genius, and a great frontman, a really good live frontman, you know. Okay, so when Blur are playing, what song would be an obscure song for them to play? But when they played it, you would lose your shit. But like, oh my God, I can't play, I can't believe they're playing this song um god that's a really good question i would say so i think my favorites things like like absolutely love beetle bum mm-hmm. um as like a song because i remember listening to that on tfi friday it came on and i just thought what the hell is this yeah um but the um i guess i think my favorite is off that blur blur album is you're so great which is a mm-hmm. it's kind of a graham coxon love song that's kind of in the you know a lot like what he does Mm-hmm. um when he does his solo stuff mm-hmm. um or on your own i think maybe on your own actually which is a which is like an album track from blur blur uh, so if they play that that would be yeah that's it I, yeah i'll go with you I'll, I'll go with um on your own brilliant i love yeah. that what what a way to finish the friday night there's a buttload of energy right there there's um yeah you're gonna be going to your campsite singing loudly there let's let's go straight into your saturday because we well we can i i've got a, i've got a late night secret gig yes of course night. yes i'm so sorry yeah please do so the late night secret gig in the glade kind of half one two o'clock were you there kind of moment i've got sleaford mods oh my god no, yeah yeah i yeah, mean yeah. at heart i think if i'd been if i was 10 years older i think i would have been a full-on <laughs> punk yeah. kind of yeah you know like that kind of back end of punk kind of mm-hmm. uh the spirit of punk i adore and um I, you know i wrote a uh, I had to write a script about five years ago about a punk band. So I kind of did a lot of listening to punk and obviously read a lot around the punk ethos. And I think, you know, Sleaford Mm -hmm. mods for me are the uh, embodiment of, you know, what a modern day punk band should be. And again, Mm -hmm. live just absolutely out of this world. Like, what are you watching when you're watching Sleaford mods? I find it, find it so exhilarating. Mm -hmm. You know, I've seen him, several times now and i always think you're witnessing something pretty mm. special yeah so what do they bring to a late night set which they don't bring to a like a, a during the day set what's that magic um well i think there's that kind of unhinged there's something quite unhinged about his energy really yeah and and also kind of the kind of interaction with his surroundings is always pretty unique like he has kind of a real it's it, he reminds me a lot of watching kind of I'm trying to think of like the kind of standard comedians I would compare him to, but that feeling of like what's going to happen next almost. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. I, you know, I saw him at Glastonbury. And he came out and just absolutely ripped it to shreds. He, he was so unhappy to be there, <laughs> and it was so exciting. <laughs> and he slagged off the crowd, and he slagged off backstage, and it, it's kind of like he's. He feels dangerous, you know, and I think yeah. that's what you want from a late night gig. Actually, is is that sense of like danger or what's going to happen? And I and I think you get that, yeah, especially the like as you mentioned, it's in that twilight area where yeah, you should have gone to bed maybe an hour ago. You're not quite sure if this is really happening. You know, you maybe had a couple of drinks, not drunk, but you're like, oh, uh, what's happening here? I mean, like it, it, the lines get a bit blurred between reality a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And and also I think chiefly what you would get that you wouldn't get on the main stage is proximity. Yeah. He is a man who is built for those small, sweaty club gigs, mm-hmm. you know, because it is like it, it's right there, it's in your face. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I'm excited about that. One of the 
highlights of my life was mm-hmm. um before blur hi- headlined um when they were doing the Hyde Park gigs when they when they kind yes. of got back together they they did some tiny intimate warm up gigs in their favorite yeah. uh, venues in the UK and they've got good links with Wolverhampton where mm-hmm. I'm from and um my youth theater rehearses at a place called New Hampton Arts Center which has got this mm-hmm. tiny gym and they were in financial difficulty so blur said one of their warm up gigs was going to be at the New Hampton Arts Center in mm-hmm. this gym and a mate of ours managed to get me my brother the pappy's boys and a couple of others tickets and we watched oh blur God. do this warm-up gig and there was 250 people there it was in a gym and we were four people away from the front because there was only 250 people around mm-hmm. and it was the second gig back i think from when Graham cox had rejoined blur and they were re- remembering the songs in front of us yeah, and they were having to tell each other the chords mm-hmm. and kind of reminding each other of the l- lyrics, and it was the most exciting, most exciting thing I've ever. Because it's witnessed. kind of the closest thing you get to see to a comedian doing a preview, but like, a, like that's like a legendary comic, you know yeah. what I mean? Like, yeah, oh yeah, yeah. wow, and that's yeah. special as well because yeah. you get to see him applying the polish live as well. It's yeah. wonderful. It was amazing. So uh, let's head to your Saturday as well. What a pleasure to be asked to put this together. Again, you know, I think Saturday morning, um, I've gone for a slightly more relaxed kind of vibe start Mm -hmm. to the day. Um, And again, just an artist who I think is absolute genius um, is Laura Marling. Yes. So, you know, so quite a lot of my, you know, when I'm not in indie, I'm quite a fan of kind of a folk and Americana as well. Mm, Um, You know, so that's kind of, that's kind of a big, that influences quite a lot of my tastes and 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 um you know i just think she is up there with some you know like some great artists and i think people will look back on the work she's creating at the moment and has created all her career really uh, and 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 compare it to people like joni mitchell or bob Dylan. Mm. like her she is a genius songwriter of our times you know mm-hmm. um and and just again just a beautiful presence beautiful voice so kind of ethereal on stage uh i've seen her a bunch of times and again mm-hmm. i mean like one of one of my great privileges was when her first album was out i was up in edinburgh yeah and i said to my friend who was producing us at the time i said god someone said laura marling's performing in edinburgh tonight and she said yeah she's performing in bannerman's Do you know yeah, yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, she was Cowgate. like she she's in bannerman's which is a tiny pub on, on mm-hmm. cowgate and she said oh, i think i can get us in so I went along, and again, 100 people in the room, Laura Marling, uh, Mumford & Sons supporting her. because they Oh, my were, God. But they yeah. were just you. So I, was, I stood outside Bannerman's and had a cigarette with Laura Marling and Marcus Mumford, chatting Ooh. away to them. And I was trying to get them to come and see Pappies. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, well, I'm in a sketch show. We're on tomorrow yeah. at six if you want to come. They're like, oh, we're leaving town. <laughs> um, but even then, even then, I just thought, God, you're in the presence of someone. Like, she was like 17, I think. And you just thought, wow. she, she had this kind of aura about her. And it's, it's just grown and grown, you know. <laughs> so um, I think it's always a privilege to see. And I just think, you know. Again, kind of hungover morning. You're in the mm-hmm. you're in the woods watching Sleaford Mods at half two or whatever. Yeah, you're hungover. Yeah. You want to have a kind of warm can of Guinness and kind of sit on oh, a rug. Yeah, yeah. And just yeah. let Laura Marling wash over you. Yeah, and I I absolutely agree. I think uh, that uh, I have loads of heroes in Americana as well. Like uh, that is a good way to like, especially either Saturday morning or Sunday afternoon. I think like, those chill times is really important to have that that lovely gear shift into the rest of the day as well. And um, yeah, uh, it'd be quite funny. Uh, do, do you reckon Laura Marling and uh, the guy from Mumford and Sons? Yeah, you know, we we had a cigarette with that guy from Pappy's once. It was excellent. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Imagine, I <laughs> dare to dream. <laughs> so after uh, Laura Marling, would you uh, who who have you got next? So Laura Marling, and then carrying on that vibe, really a little bit. I've gone for um, Alabama Shakes. Yes! Oh my god! Yeah, 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 yeah. Who are a band? I am, you know. I again, I'm just really fond of. I love their sound. It's such mm-hmm. a cool sound, and I think in Brittany Howard, again, like a truly great vocalist. You know, mm-hmm. I, I know I, I, I am prone to hyperbole, but um, <laughs> I have seen her several times now, and it's quite. You know, it's not often you get a vocalist come along where it is 
the lead instrument of that band is her voice. Yeah. And it is, you know, it, it fills a field, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, so uh, I was pretty blown away uh, the first time I saw them. And I, yeah, I've seen them a bunch of times since. And I just think, you know, Saturday early afternoon vibes. Yeah. Yes, please. So have you seen most of the performers who are performing at Paradise as well? Is that one of the prerequisites of getting in? Do you know what? It, it's actually true. I think I have seen, I've seen all of them apart from two. Yeah. And, and, and I'll tell you, in fact, I, I, I should have said this at the get-go. I kind of set myself a rule mm-hmm. of, I wanted it to be like a tangible lineup. Yes. So I, I've, I've set myself the rule of one act that is kind of impossible because mm-hmm. a few of them have passed away mm-hmm. and one that's kind of like a dream reform so yes. like yeah. so like i've kind of set myself that uh, but like otherwise they're kind of live or performing and yeah i mean they are they are all bands that i have seen apart from yeah apart from two you know what i can totally st- I can tell that you've uh, been to a lot of festivals and love a lot of festivals because you have, uh, yeah, I, I, I say um, this is supposed to be a dream festival lineup, but you really took the idea of a, a tangible, a realistic festival as well. And it has that gradience as well. You know, it has a lot of elegance to it. Well, it's music. I'd lo- it's just music I'd love to share as well, or experiences yeah. you want. Mm-hmm. You know, it's that great thing of going, oh God, I wish... I wish you were there to see this. And it's like, <laughs> yeah. oh, that's kind of how you'd sell it. It's only £120 a ticket. <laughs> on. It's only a mega drive. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> now, now I've, we've reached the next guy in the lineup and I've realised what I've done here is tossed a little bit of a hand grenade in on a Saturday <laughs> afternoon. Sleep for mods twice. Yeah. yeah, well, no, no. Well, actually, it's kind of it's kind of a similar vibe to sleep for mods. But mm-hmm. I, I actually I was worried my uh, my Saturday. You know, obviously you, you want to relax start of Saturday, but you need to get the crowd going a little bit. And so I've booked a uh, slow tie. Okay, I don't. Um, so slow tie is mm-hmm. uh, a British rapper. Yeah. Um, who his album? I think it was nominated for the Mercury last year. Nothing oh, great real. about Britain. Uh, so he's only had one album out. He kind of won uh, at the Enemy Awards this year. Mm-hmm. And I saw him, and uh, you know, I'd only heard the singles from his album. Uh, and it's kind of proper, it's proper UK rap scene rap. You know, he's, he's from Northampton. Mm-hmm. And um, I saw him on the West Holt stage at Glastonbury last year. And oh my God, it was such an enjoyable mm-hmm. uh, 45 minutes. Because this guy, he's a kid, you know, like he is... 18 19 years old and he had the crowd in the palm of his hand and it was hilarious and exciting and edgy Mm. and you know he kept on you know he had the mosh pits going and he was down in the middle of the mosh pits and people were throwing shoes at him and he was wearing all the crowd's clothes and i was it was everything you want from a from a you know a, a kind of a young kid Mm-hmm. I just thought like that again. It's it's punk. It's kind of like this young yeah. kid who doesn't give a fuck. It's it's the naughty kid in class being allowed to take over, yeah, and, and like yeah. the the crowd were in the palm of his hands, and it, and and like you know, and his his music is fucking everything. You should uh, you know if you are a kind of young angry. Uh, you know, artist in Britain. It's what how you should sound. It is. It is political. It is angry. It you know. It's a great album, and it is the sound of you know disillusioned young mm-hmm. people. Which you know, for an old fart like me, kind of, I yeah. felt old watching it, and I just thought <laughs> the fucking exciting feeling to have. Uh, yeah, and uh, I, I love it when you see. Again, I I love uh, punk and uh, uh, rock as well. So to getting someone jumping into the crowd and stuff like that, and really getting into like like really like to share the. And it's what I love about comedy as well. Someone who's willing to just get involved with the people, really have that engagement with the crowd in whatever sense it is. Like uh, one of my favorite acts, uh, Jeff Rosenstock, uh, and he I just I loved it when he 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 uses that environment as you mentioned earlier. He also uh, he goes into the crowd. It, it's 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 important for people to like kind of have that moment with that. Uh, I love the moment when they're passing the microphone lead over the top just to yeah. kind of stretch it out. It's like, oh, here we go. Here we go. Yeah, here oh. we go. And that's it. It was, it was like it was anarchy and it, in a really fucking exciting way. Mm-hmm. And I just thought, uh, yes, fucking please. <laughs> and, yeah. it, and, it, and actually, like, yeah, it did make me feel old, but in a really exciting way because you kind of go, oh, yeah, that that is, you know, that is what 
the young people of today feel like and uh, mm -hmm. someone's saying it. I loved it. So so I've kind of chucked him in there. And I think actually I, I don't mind it because I think obviously, yeah, lovely relaxed Laura Marling, Alabama shakes. And then, but yeah, you need a bit of a hand grenade in the, in, in the afternoon, mm -hmm. get the crowd going. And I think that will do it. Absolutely. Have some points thrown in the air. Yeah, that's it. Yes, throw your tinnies to the sky. <laughs> so after slow tie, who do we have? Then we've got Nick Cave and the Bad Seeds. <gasps> oh, yes, please. Yeah, Hello. which is now, I mean, like he he was toying with being further up the lineup because, mm. well, you know, obviously he is a giant of the stage, mm -hmm. literally, and, you know, but like, I mean, I've, uh, yeah, I've seen, I've seen him two or three times now. And uh, it, one of my best ever Glastonbury moments was when he was doing Stagger Lee, I think, and he saw in the audience, someone had put, this poor bloke had put his girlfriend on his shoulders mm -hmm. and she was wearing, it was like it was planned. She was wearing this virgin white dress mm -hmm. and she was in her early 20s and she was just like there on his shoulders at the front. And Nick Cave was dressed all in black, yeah. looking like the devil. Yeah. And he saw this girl just kind of started singing Stagger Lee to her and just never, like, fixed her in his eyes and just, like, never stopped. And it was just like watching... Uh, it, was, it was like theatre. It was just yeah. incredible. And this girl was just, like, mesmerised by this man. It, it was like this angel and this devil having this dance. And this mm. poor guy was just sat there with his... <laughs> and Mrs. <laughs> on his shoulders just thinking, I can't can't compete with Nick yeah. Cave. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I just, I love him for his, the you know, his theatricality, his poetry, his, his magnificence, really. He's, uh, you know, that kind of dying breed of old fashioned rock or, or like musical legend who isn't mm -hmm. afraid to leave it all out there, you know. Absolutely. Uh, and again, he's, um, He's quite open and honest in his work and really gets that tragedy across when needs to be as well. And uh, yeah, I, I can't claim to know tons about it, but I do know like, uh, yeah, he, he really shares that honesty on stage. Yeah. And, and, and his song, um, There She Goes, My Beautiful World, is like perhaps it, it's, it's one of my top three songs of all time. And yeah. it's kind of like it is... Oh, it's perfect. <laughs> and it's really? kind of, I, it's a song I play but if I've got a gig that I feel like I need to get up for, mm -hmm. or okay, here we go. It's kind of like, uh, it's always my go to pre show song. Uh, when I, if I, you know, if I'm going for a run and I'm struggling, mm. it's the song that I put on. It yeah. makes me, makes my heart burst. It's, uh, yeah. It, it, uh, and it's kind of the Lyra of Orpheus, um, kind of that double album mm -hmm. it is, a, you know, an absolute singular work of genius. Uh, it, you know, it, it, it's incredible, that double album. Um, Real. So, yeah, uh, you know, Abattoir Blues and the Lyra of Orpheus. Yeah. Um, okay. Yes. So, you know what? I, I don't know those albums, but they sound like so yeah. Nick Cave. You know what I mean? Like, uh, yeah, like like Nick Cave's things, like Nick Cave's work. They're you know at times they're preposterous, they're overblown, they're verbose, they're mm. magnificent. <laughs> you know, it's like yes, absolutely yeah. <laughs> brilliant. I, I honestly have no idea where you're going to go next, but um, please, uh, I can't believe Nick Cave's on so early. But you know. know. What? Here we go. I'm, I'm all for it. You know, choo-choo, parry town. <laughs> well, next up, we've got the strokes. Holy moly. Holy. We've, got the, we've got the strokes because oh. they're the fucking strokes. And now, now, look, that's the band that I talked about yeah. earlier where I was like, live, you know, you're not going to get the biggest show. You know, like that's the thing is they are going to come in, they're going to drill down and they are going to give you rock and roll. But it's kind of, I, I'll tell you what, like I'm, I, I, the reason I've ordered it like that is because I've got my headline act coming up and I kind of wanted, I, I thought in terms of the build and the, the combination, that's why mm. I put Nick K first and then I got the strokes because I, I, I you know, the strokes are what they are and, and live they don't, you know, they just come on and they yeah. do what they do. But if come you, on, I mean, last night, imagine that, it's Saturday, they kick into last night, yeah. you've got your top off, yeah. you're a few <laughs> beers in, it's yeah. like, yes, please. Now that's a band where you go, chuck your point in the air, and you just don't care. That's Yeah, yeah absolutely. I agree, because I think I've heard Strokes being, they are very much like, 
like, look, we're here to do the play the music that you love, and we're gonna do that album. Obviously, we're gonna do some other stuff as well, but that's it. You know, we're, we're not gonna get it out in a bit, but which I yeah, I do struggle with. But also, their music's so good, it makes up for it. So yeah, and yeah. that's it. It's just like they've they have got the songs to burn, and especially in a support slot, they're not headliners. Mm-hmm. You put them in a support slot, and that is gonna be hit after hit after hit. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So then, take it away. Yeah, so my headline act on a Saturday night is the best headline act I've ever seen. And I kind of have quite an emotional connection to watching them. Um, it's the Rolling Stones. Oh, so, wow. so yes. Saturday night Rolling Stones. Um, Saturday night watching the Rolling Stones at Glastonbury was mm-hmm. where, you know, I first started hanging out with the girl who will go on to become my wife. Mm-hmm. Um, and look, I just think they are the definitive rock and roll band. And. I came yeah. to them late, you know, I, I always kind of, when I was 16 and a, a big Oasis fan and was listening to a lot of Oasis and obviously they were talking about the Beatles a lot and I listened to a lot of the Beatles and just thought amazing. And it literally weirdly wasn't until I got to university and my housemate who has a far superior musical taste to mine kind of said, have you not listened to these albums and kind of gave me that, that run of albums that the mm-hmm. Rolling Stones did, you know, um, Exile on Main Street, Beggar's mm. Banquet. You kind yes. of go like that, that run of like four albums, Sticky Fingers. Mm-hmm. It is it just beggars belief. <laughs> it, is, yeah. it is the most insane amount of like that output in that. And literally, I think it came in like four years. Mm-hmm. Um, Let It Bleed, Exile on Main Street, Sticky Fingers, Beggar's Banquet. You just kind of go, you can't get your head around it. <laughs> you know, and, and, and I've seen some of the acts like you know one of my great greatest acts uh, you know one of the I, I absolutely love bob dylan you know i'm obsessed mm-hmm. with bob dylan um but i can't put him in my festival because i've seen him live a bunch of yeah, times yeah. and it's a really problematic experience <laughs> yeah, and, yeah, yeah. Um, i and the rolling stones uh, you know there's a lot of acts that when they've got older you kind of go oh well they're just old men still trying to do it and people try and say that about the stones but it just isn't true because you watch them mm-hmm. live and holy shit if they're not fucking brilliant yeah absolutely and when you're watching Mick Jagger <laughs> you're watching arguably one of the greatest front men ever to have lived still be mm-hmm. an incredible front man and that's incredible <laughs> And Rolling Stone, especially that year in Glastonbury, uh, it was such a te- touch of the legendary, and that, that it felt mythical to kind of have them eventually as well. And they are a, yeah, they're kind of a true festival headliner because there's no way you could really get to see them in any of the circumstances. And that's what I love about a festival: the ability to show you and showcase a lot of bands, but the bands which are otherwise unattainable. Like there's no way you get to see these people in this circumstances ever again and yeah rolling stones in particular are um yeah i I think they're great two and a half years later Mm -hmm. uh so sorry not two and a half years later two and a half years after my wife and i got together Mm -hmm. um the rolling stones were uh in london uh at the olympic stadium so i got his tickets and uh yeah just before well uh, and i had i had the engagement ring on me because i mm-hmm. knew i was going to do it and i thought well, maybe maybe i could do it at the rolling stones gig because we'd mm-hmm. we'd met all those years ago at the we'd become friends at the stones gig mm-hmm. um but it's only when you're in the middle of a rolling stones gig waiting to propose that you kind of realize they don't really have many romantic songs <laughs> yeah yeah do it during sympathy for the devil <laughs> it's Ooh, like, yeah, yeah. And so like so like we'd kind of got in there and we we're right down the front uh, 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 and uh, I'd kind of I, I always love putting people on my shoulders at festivals and so yeah I, lo- I love putting Jane on my shoulders at festivals so one of my ideas was I'll put her on my shoulders and then I'll put the ring up and um, yeah. so we got in there and Liam Gallagher was supporting <gasps> oh my god yeah, it was amazing yeah. so like so Jane was like get me up for Liam so I started to put her up and then a security guard was like no one's allowed on shoulders in this gig so i was like shit so i need a plan b and then i was kind of waiting and then i thought well maybe it's not going to be tonight and then we'd had a few drinks and she needed to go to the toilet so she had had a wee on the floor and then i'd had a wee on the floor <laughs> yeah so i was like yeah. i don't know you know maybe this isn't as romantic and then they were playing brown sugar and jane kind of was halfway around my waist kind of thing she couldn't go on my shoulder so yeah. she was kind of she had me around there and i was lifting her up and 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 kind of just as brown sugar was you know 
wrapping up, she kind of grabbed me and uh, and said in my ear, you know, like something like, you know, we're meant to be together, me and you, aren't we? We're just meant to be together. And I just thought, yeah. oh, this is it. This is it. So I kind of like got down and got my, got my ring out and went down on one knee, kneeling in our we that I yeah. just on the floor. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then, you know, got the ring up and she just burst into tears and said, yes. And, you know, everyone around us who we'd been yeah. talking to during the gig just, you know, burst in, like, always you know, just like lifting us up yeah. and the song finished. And it's so, it's so funny because, like, Brown Sugar is like, it, it, it's kind of quite a heinous rock and yeah. roll song. It's like, yeah. but yeah, that's the song that we got engaged to. And, yeah, uh, wow. and uh, kind of that was, uh, that was how I got engaged as well. So it, it, it's kind of, you know, that there's so many good vibes for me around the feeling of watching the Rolling Stones live. Mm-hmm. So they're there for a reason. Thank you so much for sharing that. That's such a <laughs> uh, that's a true gig moment. And in the the proposal story I mentioned earlier, there's one bit I did omit for the for the just for the flow of the podcast. But that yes, that ten minutes before they proposed, a guy weed on the floor just he got his dick out, started peeing all over the floor, and the guy went down on one knee, but <laughs> he's straight into a stranger's piss. And I was like, that's it's weird that we both of you had that at there the same time as well. <laughs> yeah, but I was weeing in my wife and I's piss. So <laughs> there you yeah yeah i think that's more romantic i'd say yeah yeah wow yeah and uh that's really lovely and uh yeah i love a romantic story like that <laughs> so then and then so then the late night secret gig on saturday yes. night yeah, yeah, yeah. in the glade now i i don't mind a tribute band right yes. love a good tribute band and uh, in fact for my brother stag we went to uh, glaston budget which is an all tribute uh, festival in leicestershire and yeah. i cannot recommend that enough yeah. because the lineup to a tribute band festival is like your dream lineups kind of festivals it's like yeah. well now we've got queen supported by <laughs> yeah. you know guns yeah. and roses yeah, yeah. Into, uh, it's like nuts um so um at my wedding um one of uh jane's and i's favorite bands we adore oasis mm-hmm. and there's a reason again oasis so oasis didn't make it onto this lineup because again with it being tangible i thought long and hard about this i wrestled with it <laughs> but i i think such is the bad blood now between Noel and Liam. Mm-hmm. I don't think they will reunite. And I think if they do, it will be a strange experience to watch. Mm-hmm. It won't have the unfettered joy of watching other bands that get together, get together. It, that's, mm-hmm. It's such a complex thing, what their relationship. But um, at our wedding, I got our best friends to uh, Matthew and Ben from Pappies mm-hmm. and a couple of other friends. They formed a, an Oasis tribute band for us mm-hmm. called Oasisters. And oh, performed, brilliant. Yeah. performed uh, an Oasis tribute band. Mm-hmm. That's wonderful. So that's who I'm booking for the late night secret gig mm-hmm. on the Saturday night is the Oasis tribute band, the Oasis does. Because, really? you know, the Oasis songs are so in, such a great late night, raucous sing-along songs. And I think you don't want to try and follow the Stones. I don't want to give another band the task mm-hmm. of following the Stones. So a tribute band for Oasis, it'll feel a lot more fun and everyone can just have it. Yeah, and... um Previous guest Carl Donnelly talked about uh, seeing Oasis at Glastonbury, uh, maybe not Glastonbury, uh, diff- uh, maybe like Leeds or Reading. Uh, they were headlining a festival in like 2000, and they just they had that kind of uh, they come with swagger for sure, but they just didn't maybe they didn't care about it as well. I think that you do take that baggage. So if you take that away from if you put Oasis music into people who really cared about it, like the Oasis does, that's going to be a banging night, isn't exactly. it? Exactly, that's it. Like me and me and uh, Matt Ford, who's a huge Oasis fan, mm-hmm. for his birthday, uh, a bunch of us travelled out of town. We went to Slough to watch No Oasis yeah, in a yeah. pub, and it was absolutely incredible because yeah. the guy who's playing Liam Gallagher in a pub in Slough, yeah, having the time of his fucking life, and he is happy to be there. Yeah, <laughs> and, and and quite weirdly, just very quickly, we saw Bob Dylan in Hyde Park. Uh, recently when he was touring with Neil Young and it was a really weird gig and everyone was really disillusioned by you know like it's hard Mm. it's hard to do that and we walked out of Hyde Park and as we were walking back to the train station there was a busker doing a Bob Dylan impression playing all the hits and (laughs) 
a crowd of hundreds gathered around him because he sounded like Dylan playing Dylan. And it was actually the highlight of the night. And I think that would be the same with Oasis sisters. I'm going to have to check out Last in Budget because, oh my God. That yeah, sounds dude. brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. Treat yourself. Yeah. Let's go big. Let's go. Let's go big for Sunday. Let's so, go big for Sunday. How are we going to top off this festival? Oh my God. I've just looked at Sunday and it's, it might be my favorite day actually. Oh, which wow. is how it should be. I think there's a, there's a real challenge on a Sunday of a festival to retain your audience because mm-hmm. there's going to be people thinking about sloping back, people thinking about the drive, people who went too big on the Saturday night. You need to make sure that no one's going anywhere. Mm-hmm. But you know, but but we so you have to make sure no one's going anywhere. But but your Saturday night headliners are also the kind of you know, the yeah. main tent pole. So it's mm-hmm. a real interesting one. That's what I kind of thought about. So we're going to start things off with perhaps, I mean, like, so this is, I think another one of the bands I sent you, but one of my, the bands that I think are dearest to my heart is a band called Lamb Chop. Yes. And uh, again, I, I didn't know Lamb Chop beforehand, but what a delightful listen. Like, uh, yeah. and, Lamb Chop is the frontman of Kurt uh, Wagner, and uh, it's a hybrid of like country, soul, jazz, and some avant garde stuff as well. What a joy to listen to. Oh, I mean, it's, it is like, it, like, it is just, it nourishes, like, you talk about soul food. It's like, yeah. la- Lamb Chop, oh, the, the music is just a thing of beauty. It, it is quiet, it is slow, and uh, it's music absolutely on its own terms. And when they first started, they mm. were floor fitters. In oh, Nashville, really? who would meet up in the evenings and play together, mm-hmm. and their, their albums started getting signed, and it's kind of like a name of like a collective, really, the, around Kurt Wagner, like you said. Mm-hmm. And then once they started getting successful, they still lived that lifestyle. They still carried on fitting floors, and it was only, you know, it was only about five or six or seven albums into their career that they stopped living yeah. that lifestyle. But it still shows, I think, in the music they make. It is, it is kind of, um, it is the music of their lives you know it is mm-hmm. it's not commercial it is the music of people meeting up and playing for the joy of it uh absolutely adore it and, yeah. uh, and live they off uh, again you get that atmosphere from them live he is he's a really interesting odd performer mm-hmm. um and with a very strange kind of voice that's either very low or very falsetto. Yeah, yeah. But oh my, I, you know, like I, I mean, like my favorite. Uh, Nixon was kind of their breakout record. For anyone who's listening, mm-hmm. who wants to check them out. My personal favorite is is a woman. That record <laughs> from two thousand and two. Mm-hmm. Um, I cannot recommend enough. But then from the, uh, uh, recently, he started experimenting with kind of vocoders and yeah, beat. the really yeah. odd guy, uh, Floatus. Floatus, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, the Floatus. And this is uh, what I want to tell you. Their kind of last two albums are quite odd, actually. But the sweet spot for me is kind of any of their stuff, you know, between kind of 2000 and 2006 Mm -hmm. is, you know, works of quiet beauty. And and also they've consistently released albums for the last 25 years as well. There's not been any breaks. It's just kind of like consistently coming out. I think maybe every two years or something like that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. uh, Absolutely. He's a busy boy. Yes. Anyway, uh, yeah. So, Lamb Chop. Uh, good. Uh, again, a good, like a, a lush way to start a Sunday as well. Again, yeah. it's a it's a little bit, it's hangover music perhaps because it's quite smooth and kind of like you can get into your day that way, right? Absolutely. And then the next act were, on the lineup will say TBA <laughs> because I am a massive fan of TBA. I love the speculation mm. that goes on. I love the rumors. I think that's such an important part of the festival lineup. So as well as the late night secret gigs, I want to give the, you know, the people who can't stay up late that kind of frisson of excitement as well. Mm. So, you know, they will be the TBA. I can still remember the Glastonbury where uh, <laughs> there was a TBA. Uh, we really wanted it to be the Libertines. So we started telling everyone it was going to be the Libertines. And people started telling it back to me. People yeah. said, oh, I've heard it's going to be the Libertines. And I was like, oh, hello. Now I started to believe it. Yeah, yeah. And, and we were kind of on our way to the TBA. And it was the kooks. And we were so disappointed. <laughs> we, we were like, oh, we've, we've built ourselves up for this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, so, so after Lamb Chop, it's going to be a TBA. And that slot is going to go to Jarvis Cocker. <gasps> because who isn't yeah. going to love it when Jarvis Cocker walks out on stage? And look... I'm saying to 
Jarvis, you can do what you want with that slot because in my eyes, that man uh, can do no wrong. I'm a huge yeah. Pulp fan. No. Um, but I also was a big fan of his two solo albums and I saw him do perform those solo albums. <laughs> um, I saw Pulp, you know, 98 99 i think mm -hmm. when they were kind of um just before they kind of stopped putting stuff out and it, it was sensational i saw them when they reunited uh, in mm -hmm. hyde park and i've seen jarvis do his solo stuff as well mm -hmm. and i just I'm, I'm kind of in awe of that man i just think he he is a uh a singular talent yeah. <laughs> and so so you know look if he wants to do a few pulp songs I would not stop him oh, uh, sure, if, he, yeah. if he wants to do some of his solo stuff. That's great. I, I, I'm a big fan of what he's doing at the moment with his solo stuff. But it's just like, I think you're always just happy to be uh, yeah. in his presence. So yeah, Jarvis has that slot to do what he wants. Tell me, he wants to do like a Q&A at that point. <laughs> but Phil, yeah. Phil, you boots, mate. Like, a bit of spoken word. In the <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, don't, I would not mind it. Um, <laughs> very, very odd, uh, uh, odd dynamic, but it's not out of the realms of possibility. You know, I like it. Just, it just takes requests. It's like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, lamb chop into Jarvis Cocker. Mm -hmm. And then I've borrowed from Glastonbury, the legend slot. Because yes. I think it's a really lovely. Mm. It's a lovely way to schedule things. So I've absolutely taken the legend slot. It was my cheat. Uh, yeah, so it's it's a way for you to kind of have like a fourth headline, but like a secret one. Do you know what I mean? Like it's it's one that if people won't moan about on the internet, because I remember like uh, in I went to class in 2014 and it's Dolly Parton. And I think that's a perfect legend slot. Because if she was a headliner, I think I'll get annoyed because like that's like, you know, I'm not sure if I want to see a whole set, but like a legend slot Dolly Parton, that's perfect because you get like, I think that was the most people at a single gig in Glastonbury, I think, because everyone attended Dolly Parton. Well, fantastic. What a wonderful gig. It was brilliant, wasn't it? I love Dolly Parton. I was there for Dolly as well. It was uh, superb. Um, so my legend slot is the is the that's my cheat for the lineup. I've gone mm -hmm. for a, an impossible uh, act because sadly uh, several of them are no longer with us. Um, I've gone for the band. Oh, brilliant. Yeah. Um, because I, well, yeah, the band performing songs from the last waltz, which I, you know, is, um, is a concert film, uh, made by Martin Scorsese for their, about their last ever gig, uh, where they have all these incredible oh, really? acts on it. So if you haven't seen it, mm -hmm. please treat yourself, go and watch the last waltz. It is sensational. And, and I, on the last waltz, they've got a version of, um, the weight, which is, uh, my favorite song of all time mm -hmm. where with um which they sing with the mavis uh with mavis staples and the staple sisters mm -hmm. um and um it is the best song in, in the history of the world so so you know the band are ju they're just incredible they were they were bob dylan's backing band for years mm -hmm. um they kind of they kind of helped bob dylan you know they were the band that toured with bob dylan when people were shouting judas at him for going electric yeah, you know, yeah. Th that was the guys so you know in that way they kind of they kind of helped define that, that moment from when folk music, you know, moved into yeah. kind of rock and rock and all that kind of stuff. Um, they're so, sensational. Uh, with the band as well, um, what makes them so attractive to you? What's the thing which made you go, wow, these are the legends for me? Um, so they've got, they've got, they, they, they all kind of have, it's like watching a super group who aren't a super group, really. They've, they've yeah. all got these incredible characters, uh, you know, such incredibly evocative kind of names like, you know, Lee Von Helm, Rick Danko, <laughs> Robbie Robertson. It's like Garth Hudson. And, yeah. and, and, and so, so there's a couple of things that, that make them so incredibly magical. One of them is the whirl. It's a kind of organ. That's kind of, you know, that kind of, I, I just, it's my favorite sound i think in music is that that mm -hmm. like uh you know that, that like kind of keyboard organ mm -hmm. underneath rock music which uh, is incredible and then you know chiefly what they had was lee von helm who uh was a drummer and mm -hmm. a vocalist and it's one of the you know one of the one of the best sites is, is, is an incredible one of the best drummers in the world who's also one of the best vocalists you'll ever hear yeah um you know so when lee von's kind of drumming and singing it, it's it's phenomenal it's phenomenal mm -hmm. and uh you know up on cripple creek the night they drove old dixie down the mm -hmm. weight i mean that you know they have got they have got songs to burn true true legends true legends yeah. um fitting of the legend slot uh, and i and i think you know i think in in a festival where you have 
the Rolling Stones, Nick Cave, kind of Blur, kind of these mm-hmm. kind of legends. I think like having the band ties all of that together, Laura Marling, Alabama Shakes. Like I think actually, if you have the band in the legend slot, then actually a lot of the lineup makes sense. Yeah. It, you can definitely tell it's being curated by a single hand. Do you know what I mean? It's been kind of like, it's not designed by committee. It's, I like it because, uh, <laughs> yeah, in, in a way, your lineup has callbacks as well. It's like it reference yeah. points all the way through as well. Like, uh, this is the 40 minute mark as well. Uh, <laughs> I, I really love this lineup, and there's going to be so much for me to kind of digest on because I do know the band and I've listened to them before, but um, to have context of that and going back into it. I think I'm going to engorge on that as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and f- honestly, watch the last waltz. It is, yeah. uh, yeah, it, it, it's something else. And I love a good musical documentary as well. Like getting to like, look, yeah, just see that. It's, it's wonderful. Have you ever seen a searching for sugar man? Right. Yeah. Oh yeah. yes, please. What? Yes, and, yes please. Oh, and it's rare you see a joyful documentary, but that's one of the best ones in the world. Yeah. It's quite it's quite funny actually because coming up, uh, three of my last four acts have got my favourite uh, concert films ever made. So there you go. Here so, we go. Uh, uh, the band, the last waltz, and then um, and then I'll get to the other two further mm. on. So coming out of the band, a bit like my a bit of a a bit of a gear change, but not a big gear change. I don't think is. Um, my hip hop act for the day is Run the Jewels. Yes. Uh, oh my god. Yeah. yeah. Who I have, you know, I have such a crush on. I just adore Run the Jewels. I really um, got into them in lockdown as well because they just yeah, released uh, the fourth album as well, oh, which is TJ4. Yeah. yeah. Again, there's kind of like a, a weirdly such comedy vibe to it in that they are two brilliant solo artists who got together just mm-hmm. to make a record and have fun and mm-hmm. that turned out to be the most successful thing they've done together and it's become the making of them and, and rtj has become a thing mm-hmm. but crucially it's like watching two stand-ups form a sketch group a bit like we are clang kind of vibe mm-hmm. yeah. where it's like it just kind of worked and yeah. their kind of repartee and the way they work off each other mm-hmm. um you know rtj2 was the big record yeah. for me that mm-hmm. was the sound of, for me, that was Yellow T-shirt. It was kind of like, that was the, the album I listened to walking to the gig. Whenever I listened to RTJ2, yeah, yeah. I'm right back there in Edinburgh yeah. in 2015. It's like, that is my, that, that oh, puts me right there. So for, for me, because uh, I did my debut hour last year in 2019 and uh, didn't know Run the Jewels then, but uh, for me, I had uh, Beastie Boys as my kind of like, uh, my, yeah, my, my, my people going. And, you know, you just need that energy, that that kick, Bam. just to yeah, kind of there. Uh, and and then, I, well, I think with Ed, every Edinburgh, because I've been there doing slots for a while, like you always have like a theme that year, and that was the thing that. And I like listening back, going, "Oh yeah, that's where I was." Like, it, you can, it's very evocative, isn't it? Absolutely, hundred mm-hmm. uh, percent. And run the jewels, just you know, it, it, it's yeah, it's just fantastic hip hop, and yeah. um, I love you know. Like. Yeah, that's it. And, and and Killer Mike is one of the world's best humans, you know, like yeah, he, when yeah. you hear him speak, he's kind of like, you know, it's like listening to a great leader talk, you know, it's kind of like mm-hmm. he's just got that, he's a very, very gifted, gifted man. Yeah, um, I think listen to him talk for like for ages as well. Like, yeah, and, yeah, yeah, he just has a, a wonderful soul as well. Yeah, yeah, um, absolutely. And also, like, uh, also, you say it's a gear shift. It is, but as you said, it it's not off track. It's on the it's on the same level. You know what I mean? Like it's, yeah, uh, it's, I think so. Yeah, it's I a service so. station for sure, but obviously it's it's on the road. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and and I think also gearing up to where our headliners are, I think it kind of makes sense. So so um, my before the headline act on the Sunday is LCD Sound System. Oh, cool! Yeah, um, who I absolutely adore, and mm-hmm. um, and their concert film "Shut Up and Play the Hits" mm-hmm. is kind of very influenced by the bands, The Last mm-hmm. Waltz. It was like James Murphy, the lead singer of LCD Sound System, wanted to make his last waltz, so he made "Shut Up and Play the Hits," which was going to be their last ever gig, but they've carried on making music. Mm-hmm. Um, and I love James Murphy. I love LCD Sound System. Um, it is. Gosh, it's just it's just really intelligent and heartfelt dance, and it is funny, mm-hmm. and it is fucking brilliant to dance to. You yeah, know? and um, and uh, you know, he reminds me of 
again, I, I kind of get from James Murphy the same kind of stuff I get from, I don't know, like Kit, watching a Kitson show in Edinburgh, yes, or that kind of yeah, thing. Yeah. Like he is, he is clearly kind of a, a very unique uh, talent. And I just, mm-hmm. I just love his stuff. I love watching him. Mm-hmm. I particularly love watching a guy who can't particularly sing very well, be an amazing yeah. front man. That always yeah. speaks volumes to me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you said it earlier, but that's yeah. literally me as well. Like uh, I used to be in a band when I was like 15 uh, and I couldn't sing and I was a singer as well, but I was like, you know what, just enthusiasm. Let's go for it. You know yeah. I mean? like, uh, 100%. Uh, yeah. 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 I, I remember, like, I think it was Bruce Springsteen. He, he always got a lot of flack for, like, uh, not being able to sing properly. But that's where his voice comes from. That's where, like, his, well, literally his voice comes from. And I think that's uh, that's wonderful as well because you're able to articulate your experience but do it in your own ways and means as well. Yeah. And I, and I think, actually, like, again, like, you look through and I think, like, you look at, like, the Hold Steady um, mm. as, like, being, like, very kind of verbose storytellers in their songs and, like, you know, like Nick Cave, Jarvis, Mm-hmm. and lcd sound system rtj they're kind of all very kind of and jurassic five they're all kind of i think it's, it's a very similar thing that like mm-hmm. i do really like uh storytellers in music and mm-hmm. people who have clearly got a lot to say as, as well as the music that they make mm-hmm. uh, and i think lcd sound system fall right into that and again in terms of like tracks all my friends is yes. like that kind of is, is a is an anthem um, mm-hmm. For me and a, a large bunch of friends who were all together for it at Glastonbury and before then and since then. Um, so, you know, that playing out on the Sunday night. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, yes, please. Just as everything, before everything settles down before the headline as well. You know what I mean? It's like kind of like the, the last moments before sundown. You know what I mean? Yeah, just, absolutely. Um, yeah. All right. And then, and then I think they paved the way quite nicely for the headliners as well stylistically mm-hmm. um and this is kind of my dream reunion band so this is talking heads yes hello 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 Hi. hello hello and talking heads. Oh, yes yeah. and you know if you you know if you aren't aware of talking heads listeners mm-hmm. then i would implore you to go and watch stop making sense which is mm-hmm. their concert film which is I think the best concert mm-hmm. film ever made. It was directed by Jonathan Demi, who did, um, who directed Silence of the Lambs. Mm-hmm. And, oh, wow. yeah, yeah. yeah. And I mean, the, the incredible thing about David Byrne, uh, you know, I mean, I, the thing is, I, 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 you know, I love talking heads. I don't want to just say it was just David Byrne because it wasn't, no, you know, no. it, you know, it was a brilliant mm-hmm. coming together of like Tina Weymouth, Jerry Harrison, you know, all the other Chris France, but, um, but David Byrne is, you know, some kind of, incredible genius that we have living amongst us yeah and um they're very experimental and like they had like a it was 11 years and created 10 albums for in 77 and 88 as well so yeah they yeah it's uh i think it's of a time but also timeless at the same you know i mean it's simultaneously it was made in that context but also it's relatable throughout yeah, and no, what I quite love, I, what I love is having Blur on the Friday and Talking Heads on the s- Sunday because you look at, again, you look at the career progression, you look at the, how their sounds evolved and changed and from where they started to where they ended up. Mm-hmm. And, and like, there, there are two bands who have that kind of similar journey and it's like mm-hmm. Talking Heads started as this kind of angular post-punk band, you know, with, with incredible songs like Psycho Killer, yeah. uh, you know, these incredible kind of post punk kind of they kind of defined that sound but then embraced world music and Mm -hmm. you know kind of expanded their sound until they created you know they were creating incredible piece of work but you think about songs like um you know once in a lifetime or you know life during wartime it's just kind of they are um really unique songs that you just feel couldn't have been written by anyone else and he you know the things he writes about aren't like anybody else sings songs about their sound is incredible and when you when you watch stop making sense Mm -hmm. what's brilliant about you know you are watching this visual concept as well as Mm -hmm. music and so it starts with just david byrne on stage singing to a take set that he puts Mm -hmm. on the floor then he's joined by tina weymouth on bass for the second song 
then the rest of the band come out for the third song by the time you get to the fourth song or the sixth like the sixth song they're joined by an eight piece band yeah. then backing singers and then his suit starts to expand and it's like oh it is the visual manifestation of their career as a band it, it's it's a work of absolute genius so you know wow. it, in my head it'd be talking heads kind of doing stop making sense to close the cool. festival gotcha. and now, now all of the members are still with us so you kind of go mm-hmm. there is a world where i mean they, they don't talk yeah <laughs> but, you know, they're old now yeah uh, and i i saw david byrne on his last tour which again was one of the greatest things i've ever seen where yeah all of his band were wearing their instruments oh wow didn't oh, stop cool. moving for the whole gig so the whole gig was choreographed so instead of a drum kit he had six drummers who were each wearing two drums. Oh so it was like God. a human drum kit. And <laughs> honestly, one of, one of the most incredible things you'll ever see in your life. So I think they're going to be filming that as well. So check out David Byrne's last tour because mm-hmm. he continues to make really incredible staggering works. Um, mm-hmm. But Talking Heads, you just look at their back catalogue. I mean, I, I first found out about Talking Heads at university, so I came to them quite late. Mm-hmm. And I just could not get over you know like the journey that you go on through their collection and then but like stop making sense is a great place to stop because it it literally tells you the story of the band yeah and i think that's a yeah i say that those musical documentaries really hold it tight as well uh and i like it when it tells a story uh and but also the end point as well what i really another musical documentary which i love um and i've already mentioned them already but like uh jeff rosenstock and bomb the music industry they, there was one for that and uh and it's really wonderful because it tells the story of how they sound off really punk and how and their the origins of that but also they do their final gig and they start with a song called campaign for a better weekend and it's like it's such a slow introduction but as soon as it kicks off but the whole room loves as well and just seeing that just gives me like tingles down my spine when i see it it's, I, I i've only seen it once but i just remember the footage very vividly in my head so that's it that's a festival moment um, amazing yeah amazing Another person, I think the only other person to pick Talking Heads is Matthew Crosby. So uh, oh, there you go. <laughs> yeah. There you go. <laughs> yeah, you're meant yeah. to be. Meant to There's be, a yeah. reason we work together. <laughs> so, and who's your final act in terms of the, the, the Glade set? Late night secret gig in the Glade. I've just gone for a band that have my heart, really, and mm-hmm. are perfect for that raucous mm-hmm. late night, what's going to happen next, and that's the Libertines. Oh, um, yes, man. Uh, you know, and, I heard uh, they were playing. Someone said it to me. I heard they were playing. That's so, right. Uh... That's right, exactly. Did you hear that? Did you hear it, could be the, it can't be the Libertines. Can it be the Libertines? It's actually the Kooks. Sadly, it's the Kooks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in your own dream festival, you're trolled by the kooks. <laughs> <laughs> Damn you, the kooks! No kooks allowed. That's the only rule of this festival. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so it's the libertine too. You know yeah. that just brilliant, beautiful, shambolic kind of self-immolating, self-eulogizing, mm-hmm. poetic nonsense and genius. I love them. Absolutely love them. And and I just think you know, imagine seeing them mm-hmm. together at half one in the morning. Yeah. Of, and again they have that anarchic punk sound as well it's just like it's kind of sloppy but beautiful as well yeah. and uh and seeing that at like a, like a post midnight yeah oh that'd be yeah. magical as well uh, send everyone on their way yeah all right well uh, you know what i i, <laughs> I what what are the t- I'm going to say a, a touch of genius in this whole festival as well it, it really is a paradise and oh. uh and I think we should um, head to the final part of this podcast and we're going to do some floor thoughts. As for event management, things are bound to go wrong. So here are a couple of hypothetical questions that Tom has to deal with in a manner that he sees fit. So question number one. Oh no, talking heads have cancelled last minute. Who do you get to replace them? Gosh, that's a great one. I, I think, do I bump LCD sound system up to, yeah, this is what I do. I bump LCD sound system up to headline. The Libertines drop in to pre-LCD yeah. sound system slot 
and then late night secret gig um pappies oh <laughs> yeah 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 I mean, you know what i i remember going to see you guys uh, i think it's secret dude society in edinburgh and just like it was like it's late night it was in the pleasance and like uh, you're joined by loads of great acts it was like it was perfect you know what i mean it was, like, that was a late night gig you know I that's it love that yeah good answer Let's try another one. Uh, oh dear, someone's running late for your festival and you need to fill for time. But fortunately, one of your favorite celebrities who uh, is willing to do a DJ set for you. They don't have to be a DJ, but which celebrity would you pick to do a DJ set? God, that's a really good question, actually. Thank you. Who? Oh, I know, actually. I know the answer to this. It's Mark Lamar. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, God's Jukebox is the best radio show ever and you know he is you know when he, he curates nights of latitude and they're always just absolutely phenomenal he doesn't do it anymore but yeah mark lamar doing god's jukebox brilliant i like that very much so one of your acts has forgotten their equipment but good news they can do an acoustic set which band out of all the ones that you've picked would you choose to do an acoustic set great question that's a really good question well i mean you want someone because it, like it'd be easy to say laura marling or someone but actually you want someone where it's going to be it's going to be a real buzz to see them do acoustic mm -hmm. so actually maybe like i mean like nick cave and the bad seeds would do a magical job of being acoustic so i think it'd be them mm -hmm. that's, yeah and that's again more theatrics there as well yeah 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 absolutely let's go for okay. that Okay, I don't do this for everyone, but I, I'm, I think you have a good answer for this. So uh, your fans are in the mosh pits and they're crowd surfing and they're doing something called the parry. What do you think that might be? <laughs> I know exactly what it is. It's taking, it's taking yes. the shirt off and wanging it around the head. <laughs> like that, that's exactly what it is. A yeah. universal tops off policy at Paradise. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> tops off a t-shirt around the head. That's the parry. <laughs> yeah a whole sea of yellow t-shirts oh around, yeah. yes please yes please that's the merch the merch stand yeah. for. <laughs> <laughs> that's great so there's two bands at your festival that hate each other's guts and uh, that's going to be vampire weekend and lcd sound system they hate each other there's bad beef between the two of them and they say they won't perform if the other band is going to perform which one out of between the two would you pick great question no, Vampire Weekend or LCD Sound System, I have to choose. I don't think I could get, I, I don't think I want to lose the idea of LCD Sound System going into Talking Heads because Talking <laughs> Heads, the LCD Sound System owe so much to Talking Heads from their sound and things. Mm -hmm. So I think Vampire Weekend have got to go, I'm afraid. Oh, fair enough, fair enough. It's a tough one. Yeah. Um, and finally, your festival loves you and they want you to sing one song at the festival. So if you had to pick one song to join in on and do the vocals for, which one would it be? Yeah, 100% I'd be on stage with the band to sing The Weight. Yes. Um, yeah, because that song is the... It's kind of like the, the eye of the duck of the festival. It's yeah. kind of like the rest of the festival revolves around that song. Wow. It's so kind of like... Yeah, that's oh, what a really uh, lovely way to describe it as well. Like the rest of it, it's influenced by that one moment. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah oh, yeah. well, thank you. Uh, well, uh, I think we're at the end of the podcast now. Right? <laughs> <laughs> you could have talked all night. Thank you so much for your time, Tom. Absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for asking me. What a, what a privilege it's been. It's uh, honestly, it's an honor to have you as well. Like uh, a dream guest, some might say as well. But uh, uh, would you like to plug anything or where can people find you online? Very good question. Um, I'm doing uh, Pappy's Flat Share. Uh, so we've got a podcast that's on wherever you get your podcast from. So please mm -hmm. come and join us. Um, otherwise, uh, yeah, keep on keeping on. <laughs> Brilliant. Yeah. And uh, Pappy's uh, Flat Share is one of the, my, my all time favorite podcasts as well. So well, if you, you like this podcast, you're going to love that one as well. Yeah, well, thank you so much for listening to Castle. It's been an incredibly amazing episode. Uh, if you want to support us, you can uh, follow us at Castle Podcast on Twitter. You can also follow me at Matt House Comedy. And remember to give us a five-star rating as well. At the very least, say a massive thank you to my guest, Tom Parry. Thank you, buddy. <laughs> <laughs>